to the tent. So let's acknowledge that and keep reminding ourselves of that when we have this conversation. Um, we have. I'm hearing some. It's the volume of Charlie. Speaker on the lower right. All right, so we have, so the select board voted on Monday night to put a $7 million override on the ballot on November 7th. Um, they, at the same time, they made certain commitments as to how it will be sent. Now, very simplistically, two sides. One side is this override is going to further worsen the structural deficit because it will increase spending, which is going to be baked in, making it um, much more expensive in terms of further future overrides. The other side is that the town is in the business of providing services and that it's unreasonable to think that we can continue year after year after year without having a need to deliver additional or other types of services. So those simplistically are the two sides to this. Both sides, I think, there are reasonable. I think I think we can agree that um, there's there's some truth in both sides. So I think we should also keep that in mind when we talk with each other about whether to support or oppose this override. And also, just keep in mind that just maybe, whatever side you're on or come around to, maybe, just maybe, you may be wrong. So keep that in mind as well as we talk with each other. Um, so I will... Um, First of all, I will explain what the, generally what the commitments the select board have made are. Then I'll open it up to, uh, I think Charlie has a presentation. Um, and I, if someone else wants, has a, something that they want to present as well, I'll, I'll allow that. Then we'll have a discussion. And when we have the discussion, raise, please raise your hand. Don't jump in. And I'm looking at you, Annie, but you know yeah, I'm looking no. at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm going to try. I'm going to try to recognize everyone, and I, I'm going to try to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak who wants to speak. Oh. All right. So it's not all the way closed. It's not. There's a um. There's a light flashing. Oh. Yeah. All right. So these are. The, the commitments. Um, I won't read them to you, I'll just uh, summarize. Um, there'll be no exercise fiscal discipline that provide quality municipal services. A commitment to no override prior to FY27. Continue to increase general education operating budgets by 3.5% annually. Continue to increase general government operating budgets by 3.25% annually. Fund special ed growth at a rate of 6.5% per year. Um, item two, respond to ongoing school enrollment fluctuations, fund future enrollment increases or decreases at a rate of 50% per, per pupil expenditures. Um, item three, invest for Arlington's future. This is where, this is where the money is going to go. Um, for the schools um, to fund the school committee's strategic, strategic plan that we heard about last week, there will be um, the following schedule of increases to base operating budgets. For FY24, $1 million. For FY25, $3.1 million. For FY26, $1.7 million. For FY27, 600,000. For FY28, 300,000. 
and the FY24 increase, which is 1 million, will replace the current FY24 one time increase of 600,000, and the FY25 increase will replace the current FY one time increase of 300,000. Um, that was already in the budget. Um, on the town side, um, the town will use $200,000 to add to the base budget for pedestrian infrastructure, including road and sidewalk repair. Now the $250,000 will be um, allocated for DPW to help cover defray costs of the, up, the whatever the next trash contract will be, and add $150,000 to the annual contribution to the OCAD fund um, to cover retiree health insurance costs. Um, and then the rest is, in my vernacular, boilerplate, continue new tax relief programs, circuit breakers, property tax deferral options, pursue new revenue sources, um, and um, you know, maintain fiscal reserves at 5%. So that is the, the, the select board's commitment to um, the voters as to how that money is going to be spent. Um, and presumably that will be the campaign. Um, those will be what the campaign will be all about. Um, all right, any questions so far? If not, then I think I'll turn it over to you, Charlie, because you have a presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chair. Well, uh, let me share my screen, if I may. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to skip. So this has been distributed, so I'm going to skip most of it, most of the beginning. Uh, I'm just I'm concerned about two things. One is having uh, total transparency with the voters, and secondly, securing uh, our long-term uh, funding policies. And by way of a of a, uh, I don't know what they will. There's a little paragraph, you know, in between parentheses in the newspaper articles when the Reporter is writing about the fact that uh, the guy he's exposing actually is his uncle's brother, something like that. They have a little full disclosure. Full disclosure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. By way of full disclosure, uh, I, I was involved in the in the uh, development of the five-year plan back in 2005 or so, and I also was co-chair of the 2005 override uh, campaign, which basically used the five-year plan as a way it's currently being framed to justify the order. I won't get into the details, I just wanted to, in case anybody's wondering, uh, I have had some sort of a epiphany and change of mind here. Um, <clears throat> I think we all know about how the how the long-range plan assumes a quote-unquote required growth of 3.25% uh, for the town and somewhere between 3 and 6% for the school committee, uh, school department, depending upon whatever. And um, keep in mind that the, the law allows, without going to the public, a, a growth of 2.5% uh, per year. My view is that the recent overrides and the currently proposed override uh, do not address the deficit, they increase the deficit. So uh, this is something that is very deeply concerning to me. Um, just as an aside, the the growth rate of the Arlington tax pay or single family tax bill has been 5.1% per year for the past five or six years versus an annual inflation rate of 2.44%. And I agree that within the last year, the inflation picture has changed, but it's pretty hard to compare anything because in some places, you know, there are constraints where you don't feel the inflation, they will feel, feel it in the future. Some places have felt it already, but the data that goes through 2023 is pretty, uh, straightforward in 2022. Um, as a point of interest, the um, the Arlington, if you compare it to the town manager 12, communities are, are tax, uh, are per income 
uh, per capita income growth rate is 3.8%, which is as which is lower than the 5.1% tax growth rate. So that's just, I think, a point that says that we're spending more than we, you know, in the long term can afford to spend. The other comment I would make is that I compared Arlington spending. This is data from the DOR um, uh, municipal database. And generally speaking, it's higher than the town manager 12 general fund spending. Um, there's an enormous amount of data on that, and I won't try to get, get into the details, but it's, it's shown on, on that, that graph. The red line on top is Arlington spending. The, um, uh, the, the, the gray line is the town meet, the average of the town manager's 12 towns, and the, the blue line is the municipal cost index, which is sort of a national average of, of spending increases. So, um, what, I, what I'm really concerned about here is stopping what I call deficit spending. And I think our deficit, our, our uh, approach allows the town, what we've been doing with the five year planning process is allowing the town to increase the infrastructure cost at a rate that's not supported by taxes that can be assuredly collected. And this builds up the deficit. And the, the deficit that we're looking at that is driving this whole question of the override is the deficit in 2026. And uh, I believe it's about $8 million. We'll see that on, on a later slide. Um, but the, the deficit spending assumes that taxpayers in the future are going to rescue the town and we're not going to have a credit, catastrophic uh, financial situation, which to me is not guaranteed. And in fact, the direction we're going in is, is almost going to assure a catastrophic position in the future. Um, so, if you look at the table at the bottom here, um, where it's where the where it says non-exempt shortfall, that's that eight million five hundred five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand dollars is if we have no um, override and no um, uh, no debt exclusion, no increase in ads or whatever, that those three numbers are the deficits in twenty six, twenty seven, and twenty eight. Those numbers together add up to about $47 million. So um, the town has to raise $47 million more just to cover those deficits within the five year horizon. And, and that to me is, is pretty troubling. And by the way, it doesn't mean that we're not gonna have more deficits in the future. It's, that's just what has to be raised to cover those deficits. This is by the way from uh, you know, I, I distributed some versions of um, Mr. Pooler's five-year plan worksheet uh, today, and that's where this data comes from. <clears throat> um, so the second issue I have is transparency with the voters. And I think that the statement that Christine read to the, uh, with respect to the select board's commitment um, ties this promise of new services to deficit to, to solving the deficit problem. But as I will try to show you, it doesn't solve the deficit problem. It increases the deficit problem. So we have a, we have a strange situation where the select board, which is supposed to be the, which is the, the leading executive authority in the town, is leading us into a, a more uh, exacerbated deficit uh, situation. I, I think from a transparent viewpoint, that, that spending subject should be separate from the, um, the, from the override. Now, um, okay, I, I'll just stop there on that subject for now. So I had a conversation with the uh, town council a couple of days ago. And what he said, it was sort of interesting because it, it, you know, the way that we have been working in this town with respect to the five-year plan over the last number of years is that when the five-year plan comes out of the long-range planning committee and goes to the board of selectmen, it's it's sort of accepted as gospel. Okay, and what I'm going to suggest is that it's not gospel. Okay, and it doesn't represent anything but some political viewpoints of a group of people. Now, what the select board vote the other night, and I was at the select board meeting, does do, it's a 
and the town council has basically told me this. It sets the override date, which they did, and it sets the override amount on the ballot, $7 million. The, the vote with respect to commitment on the spending is simply the select board's viewpoint. And the voters decide whether or not to support the $7 million tax levy. And then, and that doesn't mean that they're supporting spending more on the town, the schools, or anything else, okay? What the select board does not do, what their vote does not do, is it doesn't vote bind the finance committee, it doesn't bind town meeting, it doesn't bind the school committee, and it really doesn't bind the select board because future select boards can change their mind. So it really has, it's a political statement. It has no legal effect on the override referendum. And my view is, and I hope that the finance committee does this as we go forward in the future, we should be evaluating the proposed spending each year on its own merits and not based on the fact that it, it exists or does not exist in this five-year plan that it was in front of the um, select board in the last couple of weeks. Now, the um, manager has proposed uh, to the select board, well, actually, very interestingly, he does say that he didn't propose it. He says it's been proposed by the Long Range Planning Committee. But I would note that the Long Range Planning Committee doesn't take minutes and doesn't take a vote. So I don't quite know where this came from. But nonetheless, um, $7.3 million, this, is, this was included in the select board's vote, so I guess that's where it came from. Uh, $7.3 million from, between the town and the school over the next five years is what they propose is the increased spending. But it's not $7.3 million. It's really $27.8 million because the first year spending sits into the base and gets increased at 2.5% a year, or actually in our plan, 3.5% a year. And, and then the next year's 3.1 million goes into the base and that's increased to three and a half percent a year, et cetera. So the, so the total impact is, is not 7.5 million. The total impact is the sum of all those numbers as they grow in the base over the five years, which on a, in a future value is $27.4 million, $75 million, and net present value is $25 million. That's, that's a substantial number. Now that's the number that needs to be added to the $46 million or $47 million that's needed to make up the deficit that's already built into the operations. So in, in total, we're talking about $75 million over the, over the period of the plan in additional taxes. Um, and by the way, I would mention that that's re with respect to the two and a two and a half percent growth base. That is, in other words, sort of automatically assumed under proposition two and a half. And that's another $22 million. So we're actually talking, if you, from where we are today, we're talking about raising the taxes over five years, $95 million. Um, and $97 million, I think it is. Uh, this is just a little chart that shows um, how the deficit increases for people who like uh, pictures. Um, and, and, and this chart shows um, how, the, how the taxes increase, what the percentage increase over the base levy is over these five years. And in and, and the fifth year, it gets to be 18% uh, higher than, than what it is today. So we're not talking about a $7 million, million dollar increase. We're talking about substantially higher increase in what, what the tax levy is going to take away from the citizens of the town. Um, what I did here, it, okay, so this, um, it's, it's, this is interesting. If, see, can you see my <laughs> person? Mm -hmm. I can't see my person, so, all right. Um, the, the line that says non-exempt shortfall, that is, the town manager's basic plan without any override or any additional spending. Okay, so that's uh, that has an eight million, eight point five million, seventeen million, twenty million dollar deficit in those three years. That gets you to the forty-seven million dollars that I mentioned before. Now, um, if we add the an override in in there, that goes seven million, and then you increase that two and a half percent a year, so that builds up to. 700, 7,720,000 by fiscal 28. 
Notice that we still have a deficit in fiscal 28, $10.1 million without any additional spending. So just as a sort of a, a Gedanken experiment here, I, I, I said, okay, let's reduce the base expenses by 1%. So if we reduce the base expenses by 1%, we can sort of, sort of say in the black by 2028. The message is that what we should be focused on is controlling expenses, not what the data the next override is. Um, I forgot what I had in this slide here. Um, well, I think I, what I did is I said, what's the, what's the, if we took out the one time uh, benefits that we had from COVID in um, ARPA? and had no overrides and no ads, what's the rate of spending versus what we legally can collect without an additional override? And that's what's shown on the bottom of this slide. This is sort of just an informational uh, piece of data, but it means that the, the, um, the spending is actually at a level of 68.6 .6 million if we didn't have some of the one-time charge, the one-time benefits in uh, 23 and 24. So, you know, my concern is that uh, we need to have both for the benefit of the taxpayers and the benefit of the professional staff in the town and the school, some stability in our finances. And the direction that we're going in is not to have stability, but is to increase the deficit, which I think, which I'm just fundamentally opposed to. And I say that having been on the other side of the fence at one time. Um, so my, my recommendation is I think if we can do it, and I, I don't exactly have, have a clear way of saying this right now, but I, I, I think that we as a finance committee ought to consider rejecting the override without a select board commitment to reduce spending, to somehow control the growth of spending, which we're just not doing. And then I think we should, without getting into the details of the benefits of each and every, I mean, the, the, I don't want to try to debate in one slide here the, the, the proposed strategic plan of the school department. But I think that we should reject this proposal on a long-term basis and only offer support on a year-by-year -year basis if town management and school management uh, control other, other cuts, other spending, and have some sort of constraint and evaluate each year's spending block that the strategic plan is looking for on its own merits, as opposed to sitting here and saying, okay, we're gonna give you a blank check of uh, $7.3 million for the next five years. That's to me, not the way I think the finance committee should be, um, should be handling it. By the way, it's not, the school is not 7.3 million, the school is about six point something, the town is 600,000. And I also think that we should increase the, we should reject the town's increased spending proposal outright. I mean, that, I think they made those numbers up so that they would have something to say that the, that the, that the override is benefiting both the town and the school. They could get along without that $600,000 and the world would not end. So in summary, um, our taxes, by the way, the 5.1% the a year tax increases that I was mentioned earlier, includes both non-exempt and exempt taxes. And, and we should keep in mind that those exempt tax expenses are not gonna go away because invariably, you know, the town is gonna to wanna to do something about the Fox Library or Odyssey Junior High School, and there's gonna be more major projects that are have, gonna to have to be funded with, with debt exclusions. So that's where the 5% comes from. That, that number is going to continue to be higher than the, the two and a half percent. Um, I don't think we should be bundling the services with the new higher spending, the pre preservation of services. And I would really like to see this town and school leaders give more consideration to protecting the taxpayers from excessive increases. And, and, and I think the solution here is that we should have an override every year. And if, and if they want to spend more than the proposition two and a half, let's let the voters have their say on it. And if the voters say yes, that's fine. If they say no, we don't do it. 
that's my uh, my outlook. So thank you for your time. I hope I wasn't too long winded. Oh, thank you, Charlie. Does anyone else have anything to present? Presentation versus questions. Yeah, questions. All right, we'll start with um, questions, comments, whatever, Al, then Anne. If we were in a town that had annual balance budgets, or at least close, you know, where you're jiggling at the end and getting it set, I'd probably support the override. What the school and town departments are asking for is not unreasonable. Unfortunately, we're not. We're in a town that regularly runs operating deficits that are periodically eliminated by overrides. Um, it's, it's sort of a failed plan, but it's gotten us through. And if you look at the long range fund, the long range financial projections, um, we face substantial deficits beginning in fiscal 26. I mean, we're talking about, you know, 9 million, 9.5 million, it varies a little bit, 17 million, 20 million. Huge. I mean, for, for a town of our size, uh, just to keep what we have, just so we don't have to lay off policemen or firemen or teachers or close, or close services. That's what we... That's what we face. And in 2005 and 2011, partially maybe in 2019, you know, that, that's what overrides were for. So we could keep maintaining the, the, the services we have without, without cuts. And the voters have always stepped to the front. We're going to need a substantial deficit, or a substantial override uh, in two years just to keep what we have. And this override is not affecting that. <laughs> we're gonna need an override, maybe it delays a year, but you know, we're needing two overrides. This one, and then another one in two or three years. I am concerned that this proposed override will hurt the next override that we really need. This override is for new spending, um, not to cover the deficits. Uh, I believe that the current five-year plan with the amounts going to the town and school can serve both well going forward. I think the schools can make substantial progress within the current framework that they have and getting their available share that they already get. And for an example, I brought it up when the schools came in on the 31st. They put forth a proposal earlier when the schools originally presented to us, which showed about a million and a half dollars available from their share of what they get, and about another million, three million, four from from efficiencies in their budget. And they had two point eight million dollars for basically new programs going forward from from fis for fiscal twenty four next year's budget. That's a lot of money. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to come up with a million three of new efficiencies every year, um, but it's a, you know, it's, they're spending 80 or 90 million dollars. They, they could keep looking and keep looking. They could make substantial progress within the plan that exists now. It'll just take longer. And maybe we just have to have a little bit more patience. So, you know, Charlie went through all the numbers. Um, those are my thoughts. Um, I've supported every override to debt exclusion, you know, since 2090. God. And, uh, and I led the failed, I led the override for the first successful, of uh, the debt exclusion for the first successful rebuild of the elementary schools, along with Charlie Lyons and Barbara Goodman. I cannot support this override. I don't think there's a need for it. And I'm really fearful it could undercut the need for the major override that we're gonna need in two or three years that we really need. So 
that's my two cents. Thank you. Annie? So I want to start by reminding everybody of a couple of things. The first thing is that this override is going on the ballot. Our vote doesn't stop it or start it. Our vote is a vote that in past campaigns has been deemed as necessary to indicate whether or not the FinCon was with it, to, with the override, in order to see whether or not the override was likely to be successful. So this is a political vote. It's not a fiscal responsibility or a fiscal irresponsibility vote. It's a symbolic vote on our part to say where we stand on the responsibility of the override plan. The second thing I want to remind everybody of is the conversation we had with Sandy Cooler, where Sandy Cooler went through a spreadsheet and showed how the future deficits shrink over time because of our conservative approach to budgeting. Because we don't budget for what, what the, all of our uh, experience of revenue predicts the revenue is going to be, but we budget based on some conservative rules that we have set that we believe are safe so that we never have a year where we have less income than we expect and that we often have income we didn't expect from new growth, et cetera, et cetera, come in and make a difference. And then there are turnbacks in spending. If, you know, DPW is understaffed and can't plant 100 or 300 trees instead of 150, they don't spend that money. If it's turned back, it becomes part of our reserves and once it's certified, it's later spent. So those future predictions can't be seen as 100% accurate. They are likely to be smaller. Before you start thinking I'm an optimist, as certainly as a Salesforce consultant, I'm not an optimist. And I don't think that we're gonna cut that deficit to zero and we can't count on cutting it as much as we have seen patterns in the past. But we're likely to cut it some. So I'm less worried about those deficits than Al is. I also want to say something about past overrides. We passed an override in 2005, and at the point when we passed that override, our first five year plan override, we had already made huge cuts in the schools. We had cut all the elementary librarians, all the elementary art teachers, we cut language programs, science coordinators, reading instrumentalists, and crossing lines. And some of those things got added back because of private fundraising for a year, and some of those things got added back slowly over time, and some of those things have never come back and are now in this strategic plan. So the schools underwent major cuts, and those have not been restored, and we don't provide services in our schools that are provided in the schools in other communities. So, principally, while then where Ms. Holman comes from, or Dr. Holman comes from. We don't need to protect the taxpayers from the town. The taxpayers are the town. These are services for those taxpayers. And the question is, do they want to support the addition of these services? Do they want to support this override? If they really don't want to support an override to add services, we're going to know, and we're going to take another bite at the apple with less money a year from now. And that's kind of how it's going to go. In terms of the increase in our expenses, okay, if you look at our contractual obligations, our obligation to educate children with special education needs, our obligations to healthcare, and our obligations to pensions, if we limit ourselves to increasing the budget, the overall budget, by 2.5% every year, we will be cutting services every year. And indeed, between 2005 and 2011, that was our experience. Despite the fact that we were able to put some things back in the school because of the override, we then almost every year were cutting the school budget because we didn't differentiate between special education costs and general education, and the school had to pay the special education costs, which were increasing wildly, and therefore we were cutting services in the schools every year. And I'm acutely aware of this because I had kids in the schools at the time. Now I have a daughter who has an MFA, a BFA in art. And she went through the Arlington schools, but she did not get her art education in the Arlington schools. She got her art education because her parents were able to afford to supplement her education. Somewhere during the course of her education, there was another kid in this town who had just as much talent whose parents didn't have that money. And they also didn't get the kind of art education they might have from the Arlington schools. And you can just go and add that up by every single department, every area. Okay. The reason that my oldest daughter got reading intervention in the elementary school was because we privately fundraised for it. 
through the Arlington Educational Foundation. We, we can have whatever we want as a town if we're willing to pay for it. The question that has to be put before the voters is, what do you want and are you willing to pay for it? So we're not protecting the taxpayers from anything other than possibly slightly increasing their expenses so they can have some services that otherwise will cost them a lot more money when we ask them for an override and they have the right to turn us down. So I support this override. I'm gonna vote yes on this override. I don't guarantee you that the town is gonna support yes on this override, but if we honestly make an honest campaign and an honest argument about these services and what's needed, then I expect that we will get an honest vote. And that's all I'm asking for tonight is that we make our vote with the proposition in mind that the final decision makers are the voters and not us. And that there's nothing fiscally irresponsible about saying to somebody, if you want something, this is what it costs and you need to provide the tax dollars to cover that. We don't deficit spend. We're not allowed to deficit spend by law. We go to our voters and say, if you want to continue to receive these services, then this is what they are going to cost. And that's where I'm standing up with. So, sorry for the emotion. Okay. Um, what are we John, well, it's the me. John and Alan and then Topher. <clears throat> um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Chair. Uh, I actually like this override because I think it's it's you know relatively modest certainly compared to you know the second one that was proposed and um, certainly also smaller than the one that that the taxpayers approved back in 2019 where they actually approved three different overrides so I think this would be you know as it says the average taxpayer will get hit with a 460 four hundred sixty-four increase um, which seems reasonable uh, of course, no one really likes an override, but why, why is this one okay? And it's exactly what Charlie said, you know, $47 million deficit, that's, that's pretty scary. Um, so to ignore that $47 million deficit, I think would be irresponsible. Um, but one thing, uh, just as much as I think this uh, override is okay, I think the additional spending is terrible. And I, I almost want to say, is as loud as we possibly could that no, you know, override, okay. You know, that means we start getting the $7 million a year immediately. So that means seven, you know, 14, 21, 28. So they go 47 million deficit minus the 28 million of additional spending. All of a sudden the deficit's only 20. That's of course my back of the envelope calculation. Leave it to the professionals. The professionals say the conservative approach shows the deficit goes down to 11.3 million that's conservative, or, you know, maybe a little bit more optimistic, the deficit actually disappears. That's just with that additional $7 million, all of a sudden problem solved. As long as we say, no way, Jose, no more spending, Zippo. Um, so I would like to say yes on the 7 million, no, capital A and capital O, no on the additional spending. Uh, I know Charlie said it a little bit differently. He said no on the override, unless they commit to reducing spending. That's kind of the neighborhood I'm in. Uh, you know, however, whatever message we can say, uh, whatever message we can send is clearly uh, to keep the spending down is what I would be in favor of. Uh, and also I, one final point is, I think there's a, it seems like there's not a lot of clarity on what this additional $7 million spending comes from, what the legal authority for it is. Uh, I know that the town meeting didn't appropriate the funds. Uh, I'm not sure the selectmen can appropriate the funds, so it seems like it's more symbolic. So how do you even reject something that's symbolic? I'm not sure, but I would want to take those steps to reject that sim symbolic um, additional spending. Um, so that's where I stand. You know, yes, start getting the additional $7 million in immediately. As Annie said, it's already on the ballot. Let's, let's just put our weight and support behind it, and then we can feel a lot better about the deficits, but send the message out. You know, no more spending, not this six or seven million that was attached, not this six or seven million that the school committee came and presented on. I'm sure those are great programs, but it's just, you know, we can't have everything. So, again, just in summary, yes on the override, no on the additional spending. Um. 
mostly commentary on what's been said before. First of all, uh, I think the FinCon vote is more than just symbolic because it would be, and for example, if the Finance Committee voted to not support the override, it would be uh, hypocritical if we if the override passed and we voted to support all the ads and things that uh, the that was committed to by by the select board. You say that the, the only town meeting can appropriate the money. We make the recommendation of town meeting. Um, so we could, you know, I think, it, I'm not sure exactly how to communicate what you're saying, uh, what could be done for that, whether it's better to say we can't support the override because we can't support these ads or say, okay, we support the override and take us out of the hole, but we're not going to support these ads. In our recommendation of the town meeting, ultimately it's town meeting, but it's substitute or whatever. Um, the other thing, that, uh, another thing that's sort of bothered me in all these projections is that the, we show these accumulated deficits growing every year, but that's really not the way it works because we can't, as Andy said, we can't deficit spend. So for example, one of Charlie's scenarios is an $8.6 million deficit in FY26. Well, no, there's not. We cut the budget by 8.6. If we don't have that line, we cut the budget by 8.6 million, which means that 8.6 million doesn't carry to the next year. It doesn't get uh, added to. And then the next year, if we have another 8 million, that gets cut. So the, these, you know, we, we're showing the deficit as if deficit spending is allowed and we're growing this debt, but that's not the way it works. So it, it becomes incremental cuts rather than, you know, falling off a cliff at the end. And that leads to me to support Charlie's notion of an annual override. Now, I, I had some relationships in, in Nantucket and Nantucket tends to have annual overrides and they have menu overrides. They'll have an override for $20,000 to rebuild the town hall steeple. I mean, if you look at their overhead votes, have like six items on it, and they do it annually. It's a regular part, and it's sort of a referendum. Should we put in a curb cut here? Should we buy a new fire truck? Whatever. They're, they're very granular. I'm not sure we should do that. But the the, the political impact of, of what we've been doing, where we have a big override that fills a bucket and then it slowly leaks out, is that we have an override every four, five, six years, or maybe three years. And when that override happens, if it doesn't pass, it's huge. It's a major, you know, it's a crisis. With the annual overrides, you have, you, you split that crisis in five or whatever, so you can make smaller adjustments. If, if the economy is bad and people don't approve an override, it's less of a hit. I think what we're doing is what I call, you know, pushing the cliff down the road because we're not eliminating a cliff, we're just delaying the cliff. If we had annual overrides, we could decide incrementally, again, based on the state of the economy and, and, and things that are going on, to support the annual override. Um, and then going back to Al's uh, point about we're not, the, the override is proposed, you know, it's, it's like the weather. Everybody complains about the structural deficit, but no one wants to do anything about it. Um, it would be really difficult to support an override that doesn't have a commitment from the select board to do something to reduce the structural deficit. Shows something that's bending the curve. So we're just not approaching bigger and bigger cliffs every every so often. So, you know, in short, I, I support John's notion of being able, you know, potentially supporting an override by opposing the select board's commitments, which again are a political statement. I support Charlie's notion of, of supporting an annual override. And, and again, that, that vote isn't on the table, but uh, as a reason to, to make a comment on it. So anyway, thank you. All right, um, Topher, then Grant and Carolyn. Wasn't there someone else after Al? Yeah, me. Yeah, okay, yeah. right. <laughs> so I guess I'll start with this yearly override notion since that's been put up. I, I do not understand how that would work. I believe the th contracts with our unions are typically three years. So, you know, I think that's a major factor in our budgets. It's a major factor in, if you want to call it a deficit. Um, and so I'm not really sure how that would work. Um, I also don't know what it would do the political climate in town to have a pretty much constant state of fighting about overrides. Um, that's my thought on that. Um, going back to, um, Transparency to the voters. I think you also have to be transparent about what goes away or what happens if it 
doesn't get floated through. Um, you know, inflation, as we as sort of alluded to, is higher now. And when we were looking at even the various ads that had, you know, other towns have gotten through a strike, you know, I think it's still less than the rate of inflation. And I don't think that it's going to be reasonable to ask our employees to, you know, not at least get a cost of living uh, in their contracts. Um, and that's, that's, they suck, but that's how it is. I mean, if the, and we don't know where inflation will go, but it's been higher. You know, we spent a long time, I mean, two and a half worked at all. It was never repealed by the voters because we've had low inflation for a very long time. <coughs> I think I was in high school the last time it was a real problem. So, you know, I don't see, you know, and so if we don't do some of this stuff, you know, I think we will have labor unrest. Um, we will destroy a lot of trust that the school committee has worked hard to build. And I have pretty good knowledge of when there was not good trust with the AA and the school committee <coughs> or so years ago. Um, actually, a little longer than that. Um, you know, they mentioned closing the achievement gap. If we're patient about that, well, those kids don't get another shot at that. Um, uh, one thing that we only glanced on was COVID spending and taking it away. Um, I would say that if we took it away, if it wasn't there, it wouldn't have been spent in the first place. So I don't know if it really would have contributed to a deficit, but the schools are still recovering from that. Um, and we were all sick of it. I understand that, but they're still recovering from it. And I think, you know, um, you know, they're going to have, they're, they're still trying to get, get back to that. And I think the schools do have a plan for how they want to spend the money, even if you don't agree with it or agree with all of it. But I mean, a big part of that plan, I think, is investing in our teachers and staff. And that to me is, uh, you know, Carolyn brought up, you know, the power of the, the low paid employees. And, you know, that's, that's a, then that's like 20% of them. That was a big, I did not realize that it was that many. So, um, you know, I think we have to remember there's people on the other side of this besides just the taxpayer. And so uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. I'd like to think our vote is significant and not merely symbolic. And part of the ways I would think that is that if there's any voters that are undecided, they say, well, what did the finance committee do? And if they, you know, if we reject it override, then think that if we support it, that's a factor too. So I think it isn't just symbolic. I also don't know how much of a message would fall on, uh, not necessarily deaf ears, but ears that aren't um, required to listen. I do have a question. How would we, we could recommend, I suppose, a yearly override, but what mechanism um, would enable that to happen? Would it be a town warrant uh, article? So what's the mechanism? This is what decision. Okay. And you do it a year in advance yeah. so that you never fall behind. Right. And what would enact that to the selectman? A recommendation by the finance committee? Yes. Lobby up to them now. Convincing Right. I'm not, I'm sorry. I know it's sort of an open ended question, but maybe someone can answer it because I can't hear any of the responses. But anyway, that's why. That's why well, only the select board can put an override question on the ballot. And it is entirely their decision. No one can force them to do that. Uh, People can urge them to do that, um, including the finance committee or the city committee or voters. Or, um, but but it is their decision and there's a role to put it, okay. put it on the, the ballot. All right. Well, thank you for that. So I do think that if it's on a yearly basis, it becomes a little bit, I don't want to say transparent, easier to digest because people get to see it's sort of like a cash basis instead of an accrual basis or something. I mean, it does seem a little bit more elementary than, you know, the seven years of famine and save up for that sort of stuff. But 
I do think that would be a, a good avenue to pursue. Not sure how I'm going to vote on the override, though. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, and then Jennifer, and then I. Um, so, so when I look back at the school um, department and school committee's presentation, their first priority is ensuring equity and ex excellence. And their second priority is valuing all staff. And um, one of the things that's happening in town um, and has been over the last decade and will continue is that many of the jobs in town are now filled, are now the profession is filled by graduate level staff. Librarians are graduate level staff. Much of the town administrators are graduate level staff. Our payments to these staff are often, when I look at the budgets, equivalent to private industry, or if not equivalent, rather close to private industry when you add in the benefits they're getting. Um, when we look at these teachers' numbers, particularly the TAs, um, the numbers are 60% below. Len said that himself. He said these numbers are 60% below, and in the case of the TAs, they will remain 60% below, um, even with this. Um, when I look at the programs that they have, which are priority three and four, those programs have numbers that are exorbitantly higher than the numbers for the salaries. And I suspect it's because they're hiring graduate level people to do that work. Um, my concern, and it has been my concern for a decade, is that we're doing a very good job of paying our town employees who have graduate degrees um, equal salaries at the expense of those who are not at an undergraduate um, or even um, or, or, or between high school and undergraduate, and even those at the undergraduate level. Um, it is a way, it is one of the reasons we are ending up in deficits. Um, and some would say that, well, but we need librarians who have graduate degrees. But if we're going to have graduate librarians at every school, that, that is why, Charlie, you see that huge increase in the salaries um, of, of librarians. Um, I would like to see the town do something different. We can't compete with Cambridge. We can't compete with Lexington. We can't even compete with Waltham because they all have huge industry and um, corporate um, structure and tax bases. We will always be a town that has people who move to places like Lexington and Cambridge and Waltham. We will be the town that brings people in gets them to a certain level and moves them on. Um, one of the comments that um, was made when the teachers were here was that our retention of teachers is high. I was like, wait a second. I thought we were concerned that our retention was going to be so low that it would decrease the quality of education. That was not the comment that was made. So because of these factors, um, I'm against this override. And I realize that, but that negatively impacts teachers. And my reason for being against the override is because of the way we focus our attention on budgets for those with um, graduate level degrees and budgets for those without, and that we focus it on programs for our residents and not on salaries for those of undergraduate or lower education levels. Thank you, Karen. Um, Jennifer. Um, yes, actually, I was on the negotiating committee, the first one, um, when paraprofessionals, um, paraprofessionals um, uh, said they wanted to unionize or universal support among the school committee for that. Um, of course, <laughs> difficult negotiation. They felt like they had a certain amount of money. You know, um, they only have so much power. <laughs> yep, yep. Negotiations finished at 1.30 on a Friday night. <laughs> after 12 sessions, um, but um, I think there's been a feeling for a long time that the tire professionals uh, were not being paid properly. There actually have been some pretty big significant increases. What I understand is there's also been some significant increases in other towns, and so relativity, you know. Um, 
Oh, uh, so you probably know that I'm going to argue in favor. Um, let me tell you my reasoning. Um, so, so one is that I think that this has been a very thoughtful, careful um, process um, in the long range planning. As I've said before, I've, I was on long range planning for four years. Um, I've, I've seen the quality of the discussions in that, that committee. Um, and I believe sort of the conversation I've heard that that there was a lot of give and take and you know that, that things got adjusted and, and timelines got moved and that the proposal now is a consensus proposal. Um, what I understand is that the select board is is unanimously and enthusiastically in support of this. Um, there don't seem to be any doubts when I talk to select members or listen to the committee meetings. Um, and, and and they are the ones you know that are putting this forth and whose sort of political you know world is, is sort of not that unsafe, right? Um, some other things I just wanted to sort of talk about. Um, one thing I think that may be underappreciated in town is um, the extent to which uh, the state used to fund things in Arlington. I mean, in, in FY 2002, 21% of our budget was covered by state aid, and now it's around 13%. So to the extent that we and many, many other communities that don't have commercial, commercial tax base have to rely on override, operating overrides, it's largely because the dynamics have shifted, right? The state, after Proposition um, Two and a Half, the state said, "Oh, we'll we'll cover it," and then that sort of just fell off the cliff. <laughs> you know, twenty years later, um, as Annie mentioned, what that meant for Arlington is that there were really, really significant cuts in services, and especially at the schools. Um, that happened, you know, as you mentioned, there there have been restructuring, and and some things have come, new things have come on. You know, more social workers. That are, but some things haven't returned. Um, so, other uh, sort of details to, to talk about. Um, so, just to remind again, I, I met, sent an email a long time ago um, that the in 2019, when we did the override plan, um, we projected in FY24 that there would be $17.6 million in deficits. We now know from the current plan. And, and this is not updated, I think, with the current numbers, but close, is that there's a $16.1 million surplus. So $33.7 million difference between those two numbers. 10% um, $10 million of that is ARPA money. But the other 23.7 is not. A good amount of the reason that that has happened is that we've seen increases in revenues. And a large driver of that increase in revenues has been massive increases in Chapter 70 funding. Um, chapter 70 funding. So the Student Opportunity Act was passed. I can't remember exactly when it was passed, <laughs> but um, but it was a seven-year plan. To be, it, first, it was it was taking an honest assessment of what it costs to educate students in the Commonwealth, and then a plan to fund that over seven years. And Arlington and lots of other districts has gotten a lot more in Chapter. So actually what you see is, yes, you've seen some, some significant increases in spending in Arlington, but you've seen that in lots and lots of other towns. Because the state basically said, we want to fund education at a higher rate than we had been before. So, so, so you know, in fact, one of the interesting things is that last year, even though the school budget went up by five point something percent, um, if the amount that the town contributed that wasn't Chapter 70 money was only 2.3%. And that's because of this massive increase in Chapter 70 funding. So I think we have to take that into account the Student Opportunity Act is not fully funded. We just passed the millionaire's tax, half of which is going to education. I suspect that we're going to see similarly generous numbers in Chapter 70 funding in the coming years. Now, we don't know that for sure, which is why I love the idea that we continue to be conservative. But we're being realistic about where we're going to be. We're not going to be at those numbers that we that, that seem very scary. Um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted. I think that's it. Um, yeah. So, um, I hate to put it this way, but I think this committee needs to take a macro view of what's going on. 
I don't want to say the schools can't have this, the schools should have this or school. I leave that to the school committee. Um, what our job is to say, this is a pool of money that's going to be available to them. And this is reasonable or it's not reasonable. But the macro view um, of what's going on, um, the five-year plan is, it's the future. You don't know what's going to happen. I think we do um, inherently, everything we do is conservative. We fund positions that aren't filled. We do it every year. We could make that much tighter, but then you have no free cash at the end of the year. If you did that and you went through one or two cycles, there'll be no free cash and it'll be tight based on that. Because you will take that money and spend it somewhere else. Um, the whole concept of this is we are a conservative body. And I'm, I, I, again, I'm not looking to say I want to punish the schools. I don't think the town's doing this. I think they need to spend more money on roads. We just take a quick look at it and say, okay, this seems reasonable based upon the history. We look at other towns, we look at everything else. But we do have to take a look at the whole picture, not individually, and say the, the schools aren't going to have this, and hence we need to we need to spend this money. Following Charlie's logic, um, I think is I, I, that's a death wish for this town. Because we will not, we will have deficits of $25 million, be it in 2028, 2029, or 2030, they will be there. And they will have to be filled either by annual overrides, overrides every three years. It doesn't matter. The spending is the spending regards when you ask for it. But I don't think it's responsible to start spending money when we're when we're really looking at these deficits way out and we're asking on an annual basis or a triannual basis. For money to fund it it's just it's one thing to maintain the services that we have it's another thing to add to the services i think you're just really going to see a cliff at some point because it's not, the taxpayers will say no i don't have it and then there really will be mayhem in this town other josh anyone else after josh go ahead josh the last word huh well, no, um, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, I just want to start by saying I understand everybody's concerns that they've raised uh, here. Um, I'm, I'm also interested in the transparency, and I think that uh, Charlie and Alice point that it's not really six million dollars of increases; it's really twenty-seven million. That's important to say. I don't think it's really twenty-seven million because I think some of those expenses were salaries, and those will definitely carry forward. But some of those expenses were curriculum. That might have been another. 1 million or something like that. Some were Chromebooks, some were furniture, things that are not really part of the operating budget and they're not going to carry on from year to year. Um, <clears throat> and I also appreciate that it's it, it's our fiduciary role to provide sound financial advice. And so I think it's entirely appropriate that we have this conversation and, and think about things. But what I don't get is that, I and mean, we know we have a structural deficit. We know that it's just because of uh, the 2.5 percent that was set by a law maybe 40 years ago. I don't know when it was created. We, uh, like, if, you know, there's gambling going on in the casino. It, it, we know that that's the case. We've already agreed to contracts that typically have, you know, the three, 3.5. That's why our spending goes up that much each year. So I think it's a little disingenuous to say. You know, we're we're running over a cliff, or this is shocking to us, and we have to change our behavior. And you know, it, it's it really is kind of par for the course. We know we're going to have overrides at some intervals, either every year or every three years or every whatever. <clears throat> As Jennifer and Annie said, generally our overrides have really we're pretty conservative on the revenue projections, and generally the overrides have lasted one, two, three years longer than they're projected. Um, <clears throat> I also think it's it's some of the comments have been like, well, how can we, you know, we really only have an obligation to vote on this year's budget or, or the next year's budget. We, we can't commit anything about future year's budgets. The whole breakthrough in the five year plan and the long range plan was, well, that that was a reaction to say, well, it's stupid to, or not stupid. It's not prudent to budget year to year. We have to think about the future. We have to be, you know, planning that way. So again, I think that I, I wouldn't diminish that. I would think that the school committee has made their best guess as to how 
what money they need to provide the kind of services they feel that the town, I mean, they keep saying that our citizens kind of expect the schools and the quality of the schools um, <clears throat> is certainly a huge benefit of the town because as people think about what, you know, why they might want to move here, schools are, are pretty important. If we want to cut our expenses, do we want to increase the class size, cut teacher salaries? And if we don't have good retention, that has trickled down expenses later on. Um, do we want to cut trash pick up to every other week? Do we want to cut <coughs> services? What, you know, what is it? You know, and again, I totally appreciate the fact that it's important for to exert pressure to cut because if you don't do that, then it really gets out of hand in a, in a different way. So every finance organization, I, you know, they always say, you know, you know, our revenues are going, everything is great, everything is great, but we just want you to cut the admin expenses by X percent or whatever. So I, I get that, but I think that when we look at what we're talking about, Charlie, you were really focusing on our expenses and that they're, you know, it's irresponsible for them to keep going up. As I said, I think we're the other half of that is the revenues. We're not, we don't, I don't know what percentage we put in there for the revenue growth, but I, it seems like it's conservative. <clears throat> but then the third part of it is, is, as I said, the services that we're providing. And that that is a, a really important political part of the message, because although that we, our vote, none of these votes are binding on how that money is getting, getting spent in the long range plan. It is, again, we have to kind of, I think, embrace the idea of long range planning and embrace that we're kind of trying to raise this money, not just to kind of close that gap, but also because we wanted to fund the kind of town we want it to be. And if, if the whole campaign goes out and says, okay, we're going to be promising these things in the school committee, that, 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 and then we say, you know, never mind, we're just going to kind of make sure we don't deficit spend, then it's going to be that much harder to, to get the next override pass because we've really done a pretty good historical job in meeting all of those political and financial commitments for all the overrides that I've been involved with. So for those reasons, um, and, and the, the final reason that Annie raised is that, you know, we're, we're letting the vote, you know, we're putting out to the vote, the voters, we don't get to craft that message of the campaign. Hopefully the campaign is honest and transparent and forthright. Um, but I think given that the selectmen had voted to put this on the, on the thing, and, and I guess they don't have the, they don't have the leverage to make a more, more nuanced vote unless we kind of split it up into a menu thing. But <clears throat> they've told, everybody has told us how they want to spend it. And I think that it, it wouldn't be right if we said, okay, well, we're going to vote for it, but we really don't hope you meet your, uh, you know, expectations of how you want to spend it and just save the money, hoard it, not hoard it, but, you know, whatever. So I, I will be voting for override. Thank you, Josh, for that. Um, well, that was very conveniently. Josh just made most of the points that I was planning to make. So I second most of those. Um, but just, I, I guess I just wanted to emphasize, I feel for me that when I look, especially at the school budget, because, you know, overwhelmingly this override is going to the schools. Of course, there are things that I personally, if I had a line item veto, there are things that I would take out. But nobody elected me to do that. They elected the school committee, and the school committee hires the superintendent. And I think they're being honest with the voters if they say, you know, you elected these people, these are their priorities, this is the plan, and the plan is going to cost this much. I see my role as to say, does this budget make sense given what they said their priorities are? Um, and assuming they're going to be honest about where the money is going, especially to uh, the collective bargaining agreements, um, I'm in favor of the override because I feel like it. The voter should have the opportunity to say, you know, yes, we've elected this select board. Yes, we've elected this school committee. This is what they're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Daryl. So I hope that by waiting this long, <laughs> we'll be enough of, of a clear case about which way to go. There is, I think, both viewpoints have made very compelling. Uh, cogent points. Um, I walked in here really expecting to vote for this. Um, I, I found Al's um, um, explanation of how this impacts 
uh, potentially impacts the future budget situation very, um, very convincing. Um, on the other hand, I think the school department made a very clear case for how they would use this money. And even though I don't have kids myself, I firmly believe that a strong, vibrant educational system in a town is critical for a town to be um, to really live. And towns that don't have that eventually die. They don't go away. They just sort of almost become zombies. So I think that's really important. Um, on the capital planning committee, uh, you know, one of the expense items um, that people really firmly believe in is you know a walkable town and that takes money um, so i think the town has made a case there um, i frankly am terrified of going to try and go to a yearly override system um, i would guess that if you did a study of towns in the state that have done this one that's few and far between and two, I think eventually, you, I think it puts us on a real slippery slope to eventually get to the point where, um, you know, these overrides are, um, you know, repaired on the town hall. I think eventually you get there. Um, and so I really wouldn't want to go in that direction. Um, like one thing I don't, I don't really understand the the override without the school and, and town funding. That just seems to me, I don't know how you defend $7 million. That's just a pot of money and explaining to people how we got there. At least um, we have sort of a clear budget from what the schools gave us and what the town has given us to rationalize the $7 million. Um, and sort of picking up on what Josh said, you know, the structural deficit is unfortunately a, a bug or a feature of this town, depending on how you look at it. And there's really nothing we can do about that. So um, I think it's just something we have to live with. Um, uh, the, the, the woman who abuts us in the back, um, in our backyard, so two, three years ago, uh, that if that override passed, she's on a fixed or She's on a fixed income and she'd have to move. She's still here. People keep coming to this town. Um, so, you know, clearly we're doing something right. If the select board was so enthusiastically in support of this override, um, I think it's a pretty clear indication that people want the level of services that is currently being provided. And that there's a cost for that. So um, I think I'm sort of back around to how I was when I walked in here, but I will be supporting it. All right. Is there anyone um, I want anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Um, shit. Jordan. 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 <laughs> you guys are like sit together too. <laughs> So um, I'll just uh, I'll just try to be brief here. You know, I was really on the fence about this. You know, uh, professionally, I work in municipalities. I've worked in four municipalities now, and I've never been in a municipality during the time when we've had to um, vote for an override. So. I think this one, it's really a tough one, and I think everybody's made really good points, right, whether you're for or whether you're against. I think certainly the level of services, especially for the schools, um, are what I think and what I've come to learn that people in this town expect. They want a high level of service. They want to be, you know, the town manager 12. Um, you know, those are some of the premier communities in Massachusetts that I think that we want to be like. Um, but given you know the numbers and uh, when you look at our property values and you look at the constraints that we are in um, for our budgets, you know we end up coming to the conclusion like we have that revenues don't end up keeping up with our expenses. So we end up having to do these overrides. Uh, 
periodically um, or concentrated within the last few years. Um, I hope we never end up looking like Nantucket. I did a quick look at Nantucket. They've done probably three or four dozen overrides mostly in the 90s. And I think that that looks like a complete disaster. So please, let's not go the way of Nantucket. Um, you can look up the history too, if you go to the Division of Local Services for Prop two and a half overrides. I'd recommend everybody does and just poke around. But um, I think getting back to the original point of whether you support it, whether you don't, I think, you know, you really could make, and again, not to be neutral on this, I think I came in here thinking more voting against for, I think many of the reasons Al Toski that you made is, you know, good financial management. You wouldn't want to put yourself, um, you wouldn't want to be intentionally putting yourselves in a deficit. But I also, again, from, you know, learning about the community and understanding what the needs of our residents are, um, and especially the needs of the residents in the precinct that I live in, precinct one, where I think many of the services that, um, and that are being proposed, especially for the school, uh, would benefit from. Um, I see that there's a very compelling reason for voting uh, for the additional funding for a lot of these initiatives. So, um, you know, I it's tough for me to say yes, but I think I'm going to be voting in favor for it. All right, thank you, Jordan. All right, Shane. Yeah. Shane. <laughs> I, All right. Knew, I knew you were yeah. I just knew it. You're just telling me how Oh, you, I knew. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, thanks everyone. Um, this has been really informative and educational. I appreciate all your, all your viewpoints and really one uh, of the reasons why I like uh, like finance committee. Um, I guess so. I'm going to vote yes. Uh, and, you know, just I was just looking at the the presentation from the superintendent of the school committee, and you know, so much of what the town provides is through its people, right? And I think a lot of this budget is going to be focused on. People, right? We're talking, we're not talking about only paying the teachers, but we're talking about professional development, pathways to licensure. You know, for so many of the staff in the schools, we expect them to have a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and be licensed. And if we're going to recruit and retain and good people, we need to sort of, our, our, our budget needs to reflect that and to sort of compete. And I know we're not going to compete with everybody, but um, I feel like. The superintendent and the school committee have spent a lot of time, and I'm, I I hear Al, you know Al Al Tosti and Charlie and others like fully respect and understand that this is the, the budget numbers are something we'll have to confront, but I think a budget is also a value statement. The town provides services services that so many of the taxpayers consume and value, and that's why I'm going to vote yes. Anyone else we haven't heard? All right, I, I know a couple of other people have their hand up for a second time, but before I do, I want to put, put this out there and, it, and it's, um, it, it's following up on what Josh and Daryl said. The select board, the elected officials of our town have put, on an, put an override on the ballot and they have said, this is what the money is going to go for. There's going to be a campaign asking the voters to pony up $7 million for these things. And I don't, I can't imagine an override in Arlington that does not make promises that they can, or anywhere. If, 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 if you were to ask me, if I went on the finance committee, I knew nothing. You would ask me, Will you will you vote for a seven million dollar override? I would say, well, what for? Would you? Where is it going to go? And if it's just to to shore up against a future deficit, I'd say, well, why seven million? Why not one million? Why now? Why not? Why not three million? So I think, just practically speaking, there has to be a reason to put before the voters to vote for. It. Now, once that happens, once the select board says, this is what's gonna go for, and the voters approve it, do we as the finance committee say, we're gonna ignore that? We're, 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 we're not, next year's town meeting, we're gonna say, we really don't care what the select board said 
They don't care what the campaign was. We're going to tell the town meeting not to give the three million or one point three million dollars to schools next year. Aren't we immediately putting ourselves in an adversarial position with the school committee that for which we will pay the price as a town? I think going down the road in the future, and, and I could be wrong. I'm just putting that out there because I would like people to to think about that and say. Well, no, we don't have, we, that won't be the situation. We don't, we can deal with that. What, what do we do on the floor of town meeting when we say, um, no, we're not, we don't recommend the schools get that money. I know exactly what's gonna happen. The school committee will have their amended motion to amend the budget and say to town meeting, the vote is voted for. And then we'll be the battle on town meeting four. Do we want to put ourselves in that position when we say, okay, we'll vote. We, we, tonight we will vote for a $7 million override, but we are not going to be bound by these But I, 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 don't, I don't know what the response to that is. It is my, just my concern about how we would handle this if we were, if, if we were to take a vote other than yes, we support or no, we don't. Yes, we support the override as the select board has put on the ballot with their commitments. So I'm just putting that out. And I know that John and Charlie had their hands up, so I'll go to John and Charlie. Yeah, um, so as far as like, what you explain to the voters, where, where's this money gonna go? I would just say it's going to the, you know, the school operating budget is going to increase by $17 million over the next five years. That money has to come from somewhere. That's where, and that's where the override is going to go. That's where the override is going to go to fund that $17 million increase that the town committee, town meeting already approved. It's in the, it's the, this is the official long range plan. And that increase has been, it is um, presented there. That's where the money's going to go. Uh, so, I mean, to me, like, how can you have a, an override without additional spending? That, to me, that makes, like, I have a hard time accepting that question because it seems like, you know, let's just say, you know, maybe this oversimplifies it, but let's just say you run up a credit card debt throughout the year and you say, all right, well, I'm going to get a big bonus at the end of my year, so it doesn't matter that I run up a credit card debt. And then when you get the bonus, you say, all right, great, now I'm going to Europe or I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to spend that bonus on something else. It's like, okay, now what about the credit card debt that you ran up? The, the override is gonna go to this additional spending that we currently can't afford. So to say that we're gonna have an override and then take on new spending, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't understand that. Um, and then one final thing, sorry if I'm taking too much time. Um, if it's a straight up yes or no, uh, without any message to, to kind of at least uh, disagree with the spending, then I would probably not vote for the override. Um, because because I I hate the idea of that 105 million jumping to 112 million and then everybody saying selectman approved it you approved it it's 112 million I I, I can't support that so I so that's wait 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 I don't put your hands but, well I have a point of order question it point of order might be the wrong question I need to understand how this is happening so uh, this is a good opportunity to to point out that. The question I ask is going to come up soon. It's going to come up this fall because the FY24 budget will have to be amended this fall to add the, the, that amount, one million into the budget. So we're going to have an we're going to have an override election when in November seventh. November seventh. Okay, so there's an override before town meeting discusses this. After. Yes, I, okay. I'm not sure of the timing whether there's going to be a town meeting yeah. that. That that meets and votes contingent on an override passing or the other way. Yes, but in any event, this this fall we will be we will be presented with um, an amended budget. We're gonna have to deal with that. So um, so it's right off the bat is that is that concern that. That we might be in this battle. Another point so, of order. all right. So, Charlie. Oh, wait, he has another point of order. Okay. I have a question. Let me say this. We'll be presented with an amended budget 
which way, saying so if the you town, the passes, town, the, well, the, this is the budget, or if your rent fails, this is the budget. The town, right. So if the, I, I'm not, I don't know what the timing is going to be. Whether there's going to be town meeting that will vote a contingent budget, or there's going to be an override and then a town meeting. But let's just say, let's say there's the override and then town meeting. Oh, okay. Then the town manager is going to present to the finance committee right, a proposed it, budget that's going to have this. This first right, will be the effect of the vote. If it's the other way around, we're going to have town meeting presented with uh, two two budgets. One one if the overall right passes and okay. the existing one if it doesn't. Which we did in twenty twelve. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Presented two items. All right. Well, the budget's already passed. All you have to deal with is the new money. It, it depends on the, the timing, whether the town meeting's before or after. Right. All right. So, uh, Charlie, you had a hand up, and then Annie, and then um, Jennifer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for, uh, just two points. The first is that, um, you know, with respect to Josh's comments, uh, there's nothing disingenuous about my suggesting that we have override votes every year. I'm basically trying to get the decision making put into the hands of the voters uh, on basically on a real time basis. And secondly, I think the the dichotomy that you just presented of um, the possibility that if, if we vote in favor of the override, that we can't vote against specific expenses in the future means that voting in favor of this override advocates our ability to do it and make informed decisions about future spending. And I think that that's, that's a real problem. And let me ask you this, how is this, how would this be different than the past override where the select board made its, made similar commitments and all, including keeping to town operating budget in three and a quarter and school at three and a half and sped at seven. And we as a finance committee made sure that was our job to make, we made sure that that the, the budgets that we presented at the town meeting fell within that. How is this different than the 2019-05? It's not, other than the fact that we're facing larger deficits and we're going down this, we, we, we're going down a path that's worse than we were in the past. And 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 there's nothing wrong with saying that despite what we've done in the past, that's not the correct path to go in the future. That's that's my position. I just want to clarify that. It's, this isn't that we're going to be doing something. If we were to do this, I, I it's not you. new. It's a question of now we have these much larger deficits yes. that will continue to grow. That is why the decision now may be different than what my, my point is that our expense levels are too high, much too high. And, and um, you know, I have been on the other side. I co-chaired an override. I co-chaired a debt exclusion. So I'm, I'm not afraid of spending money, but I think we have to have, we have to be rational about where we're headed. Yeah. Well, my first question is, are you ready for a motion? If you're not ready for a motion, then I got one more thing to say. Well, you can have, have your say, and then I think Jennifer has something to say or a question or something, and I'm going to open it up to anybody else. Who... So, you know, the, the commitments that the select board is making are assuming somewhat of a steady state in the world. And um, we have in the past modified those commitments because uh, things happened. You know, in 2005, we voted an override and we said that we would be back in five years and we weren't. And we made deep cuts in services because the economy had crashed and we had people losing their houses in town and we didn't think we could morally afford to raise property taxes. Um, you know, I am a, the, the caricature of a tax and spend liberal and I wouldn't have voted for an override that year. So. Um, and it wasn't because I couldn't afford it, it's because I was seeing an economy crashing all around my shoulders. So we are not hampered by the select board's commitments or any other political statement from doing what is fiscally responsible in a crisis. 
So that's how that works, John. We, we can recommend a budget that doesn't follow this plan if this plan is no longer connected to reality. But this five year plan is not approved by Tom Weed. It's fine. No, it's not approved by anybody. That five year plan is a projection that's made by the town manager that's used to guide the finance committee, the select board, the school committee, and the town's um, administrators in their future thinking. Okay, it's a way of saying to them that thing that you want to do this year, it has this implication five years down the road. All town meeting votes every year is that year's budget. So they haven't committed to any of this, they commit to a budget every year. So we use that plan, as Josh said, to control our forward looking future and saying, here's what we think the future is going to look like. And we have for almost 20 years done it that way. And in many of those years, we've used it to say, this is what it's going to take to preserve the services that we have. Okay. This year, we're saying, this is what it's going to take to preserve the services that we have and provide the services the community is now demanding. And the voters are going to say, yep, we're ready for that or not. So that's, that's how that works. Um, I don't know. I'm ready to vote. But I don't have a couple of very small points. So one is I do understand that the um, time meeting will be mid-October, and that's because of the timing of the MBTA committees and the fossil fuel free demonstration pilot timing meets. Um, so that it would be a contingent vote, I might understand. Um, so I just want to say I do understand the the worry about these numbers. Um, you know, the two of our rights I worked on 2011, 2019. We made additions. We didn't just fund bare minimum, right? Um, those additions weren't as big as this. So I, I, you know, I get this. I, I think that these are important additions to make. Um, I, I believe the school committee that they are seeing a change in 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 retention rates. And I think the the point about retention was about younger teachers who aren't retiring. Um, but you know, at some point, you know, teachers are willing to accept lower. If they feel they have a good supportive school district, which we do, but there's if it gets too low, you know, it's irresponsible to your family. So we don't want our our school system to have numbers that people feel are irresponsible to their family to keep that job. And that's that's so that's um that's part of it. But that's it. I don't say anything else. Alan Jones. Just a, a couple of responses about you know frequent more frequent smaller overrides. Again, other, other towns do do it. It becomes almost habitual and, and, and sort of works. And I know people in Nantucket they sort of love them. Um, but uh, uh, it, you know again, I think the more important point is that if you have override votes, which if they fail, that means something that a group of people want doesn't happen, as opposed to if it fails, the town's economy collapses. It it, it allows people to. You know, be more you know reasonable about whether they vote yes or no because they know that a no vote isn't going to cause a collapse or layoffs, you know, make massive layoffs. It's only going to do a small thing, which is you know, more frequent, smaller ones gives you know more of a democratic position there. Uh, and also, to, you know, to Carolyn's point about teacher salaries, there are, there are two parts of that equation as we all know. And I think I think a lot of us have had questions about the headcount growth. In the school, so you need more people pay them less or fewer people pay them more, and that's a choice that the school committee has to make every year. But the thing that really bothers me is it's sort of the, the seventh generation thing. If you look at any of the charts and graphs over a period of time, you have income growing at a rate, re re town revenues growing at a rate with overrides, and you have town expenses growing at a faster rate. So you have a, a continuing deficit or a structural deficit that's the difference. And it, it continues to grow without any without any effort, without any seeming effort to, to change those curves. And I don't think we can make the assumption that the town has an infinite capacity to you know, vote increases which are growing faster than incomes, faster than the general economy. I don't know why that's happening, but just from that you know, broad sense, just look at the graphs. How long can that be sustained? And without the, 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 the crude statement that I've told Charlie from a boss of mine, the, 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 the longer it takes to recognize and correct a bad trend, the worse it gets. 
and, and, and I think it's irresponsible for me to vote towards something that's going in a really bad direction without any attempt to, to change that curve a little bit. Uh, it, 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 yeah, I, I just can't do that in good conscience. Well, um, I've said my piece. Um, but I, I just urge the committee, there's been a lot of discussion. It's been a good discussion. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things, yearly overrides. Well, I, I'd urge the committee to keep it simple. The selectmen have made a, a vote and we should either support it or not support it and not do a whole bunch of amendments. I mean, we need to keep our decision-making process clean. And, uh, and we'll worry about the fall town meeting in two years from now, two years from now. Fine. Um, just to add to that, um, the override is, as you said, it's a, it's a set number. It, nowhere in the override is it saying what it's for. You, we have the ability, to, the, the town has the ability to do that if they want, but this is just a general override. So I, as far as that is concerned, you know, the spending, I don't think we're in a position to say we are not going to spend it on the schools. We're not going to do this. I mean, I think our position is going to be quite clear, uh, but I don't think at this point we need to even address that. All right, uh, a couple of more questions and then I'll entertain uh, uh, our comments are all, and then I'll entertain a motion to take it. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a quick question. Thank you, this has been incredibly helpful and insightful to hear your inputs. Um, was, was the select board decision unanimous? Yes. Mm -hmm. There was one select board member who wasn't present that I know that he would have voted for. Thanks. That's Carolyn Topher. So I, I know it sounds like I'm at, I'm talking in micro terms when I address the TAs, but I'm really talking more macro about the fact that. Part of the reason our expenses keep going up is because we're switching from um, undergrad to graduate level staff across the board. And we're paying them at very um, relevant amounts. And in the process, we also want to increase programs which we're spending. And in the process, we're cutting out the lowest group of people. It is a more macro way of looking at it. It just happens to be one group of staff. Um, and it's one way to deal with the deficit issue. It won't take care of the entire deficit, but um, it's, a, it's another way of looking at how we spend our money and why we spend it where we do. Okay. Yeah, just a point on the yearly override, not to beat it to death, but another way to- It's called more frequent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But another way to avoid the go off the cliff side of it, to some degree is you, like you're doing this year is you're passing at the core absolutely you know you have to have you know two budgets that that fiscal year you know and then if it fails you have time to react so just my, just my thought um, real quick point uh, i know i've already spoken a couple of times uh, on monday night the town council was very clear that they had to have three votes he, 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 he stood up and said this is what you need to do a, you're gonna have the override, yes or no. B, are you gonna approve this spending, which you know that's a separate issue. And then three, the date. So I, it's clear we don't have any opinion on the date. That's out of our, our realm. But it was definitely two specific questions, and they had separate votes on each of them. So I would think it'd be appropriate for us to have two separate votes. But that's my final final comment. Thank you very much. Anyone else yes. has anything to say? No motion. Uh, Annie. So I move that we support the selectmen's vote as recorded by the selectmen, including all of their commitments and the dollar amount of seven million dollars. Second. Second. Any discussion? Carolyn. Would amendment that we split the question between the override and the additional spending. Second. That motion has been made and seconded. Any other discussion, comments? 
All right, so we will take Charlie's uh, motion first. Um, so Charlie's motion is um, first, first to vote to support a $7 million override and the second is to vote to dispense. So the, what we're voting on is the decision is to decide to split, correct? I move that we split the vote. I'm not, I didn't move that vote. In other words, Annie made a motion for a single vote. Right. I'm and making a motion that we have two votes. votes. Right. 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 So we will take that first. Does everyone understand <clears throat> what we're doing? I'm sorry, could you be that right. in layman's terms? So <laughs> what we are voting now is whether we will take two votes. What will the two votes? At the, if we if we decide if we vote to take two votes, the first vote will be to support an override, and the second vote to support the spends associated with the override. If Charlie's motion fails, then we will just take one vote, Annie's motion up or down. Out of curiosity, would that be in the wrong order? Because if, if people are I mean, not the single or double, but in the, if there's two votes, should we vote the additional spending first? Because otherwise, you're voting for the seven million. Right I'm now, just trying to just right trying now to follow. We're voting whether to split. We can just we can. Okay. Okay. If the, the question is, okay. do we have do we vote it? Okay. Split it. Okay. That's what I'm following. All right. So, any other questions? All right. All those. Who wants to split the vote into two? Raise your hand. One. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Can you keep your hands up for yeah. just a second? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I changed my vote. Okay. <laughs> so how many are there? Eight, eight, four splitting. Yeah. No, I have. I only have seven, so I missed someone. Okay. Raise your hand again if you want to split. Josh. Oh, Josh. Okay. Eight. Okay. Eight for splitting. Those who do not want to split the vote, raise your hand. Ten. Eight, five, six, seven. Eight. Nine. Keep them high. <laughs> I can only type so fast. Thank you. All right. So we will have one vote up or down. Annie's vote. So Annie's motion. So the motion before the Arlington Finance Committee is do we support the select board's um, vote to put a $7 million override onto the ballot in November um, with the commitments um, that they have made. Does everyone understand what we are voting on? Any questions? All right, all those in favor of the override, raise your hand. One. Ten. You keep them up? I wanted to make a point. I think right. we really need to be looking at. Okay. Let's see what she does when the no votes come up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You have 10? I have 10. Okay. Ten. All right. Those who oppose the override, raise your hand. Seven. Uh, hold on. Wait. Um, I missed someone. Hold on. Charlie, Dave, Al Jones, Jones, Brian. Oh, Grant, Brian. Okay. Grant, John, and Al. Okay. Hey, Madam Chairman, you almost came close to having a vote. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the finance committee supports the override um, decision by the select board by a vote of 10 to 7. I want to thank 
everyone for the caliber of the session, I think. I think this is a service to the voters, whether the, if they listen to our um, discussion tonight, I think they will be well educated. However, they may decide, I think we, they will be helped by um, our very thoughtful, um, respectful uh, conversation. So I greatly appreciate that. Last order of business is housekeeping uh, election of officers. Okay, so. We have um, four positions open, one for chair and three for vice chairs. Our current officers are uh, Christine Deschler as chair, and our vice chairs are Daryl Harmer, Alan Jones, and Amy LaCourt. Um, so nominations have been solicited in advance by email. Um, nominees can also be accepted um, right now during the meeting. Um, so you can either share your nominations to me directly, um, or you can share them in front of everyone during this meeting. Um, and then um, after the nominations close, uh, we're going to have the nominees have the chance to remove themselves if they wish to um, not stand for election or re-election. Um, voting will be by private paper ballots. Um, and um, so now I would like to ask, oh, so first I'll just kind of list um, the candidates that we have received so far um, is uh, the same kind of slate of folks who are already in the position. So Christine Deschler for chair, and then um, Daryl Harmer for vice chair, Alan Jones for vice chair, and Annie LaCourt for vice chair. Do we have any other nominations? Yes. I emailed you uh, some. Uh, when did you do that? Earlier today. To my personal email? Town email. Hold on. Yeah. I don't know. But I might as well just say them since <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, yes, the different the two different nominees that you hadn't mentioned um, are uh, Al Tosti and Charlie Foster for the vice chair. I uh I decline. I'm sure you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> I know. Charlie? I decline. Okay. <laughs> so well, that's um, why I emailed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I don't see the email Yeah, I don't see it. Okay. Um, no, no worries. Yeah. Um, okay. Because he's having an event. Or <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brian. Um, since we have, if there's no other nominations, and the okay. people are, can we just, can we just, huh? Nominate Dean. He's not even here. <laughs> <laughs> I decline on his behalf. Just yeah, uh, move by, by acclamation here, uh, a unanimous acclamation. Does someone want to make well, a motion? Chair cast one vote. Yeah. Okay, Brian well, just did, I second it. Well, there's no confusion. Okay. Okay, um, so all those in favor of the slate of candidates, which would be Christine Deschler for chair, Daryl Harmer for vice chair, Alan Jones for vice chair, and Annie LaCourt for vice chair, please raise your hands. Okay, and it's unanimous, perfect, easy. And to think that I made these today. <laughs> That's why. So I'll save them for next year. Thank you, everyone. That's right. All right. So the next event is Wednesday the 21st at Charles House. We'll have a big party. Can't wait. And then we have then we have uh, ooh, back to the porch. Yeah. Then, then we have it at one last meeting, which I just take to be very brief and it'll be by a Zoom for uh, transfers, and that's the 26th. When's Monday the 26th? And then we will be done until October. Does anyone have anything to they want to talk about, raise? Uh, um, <laughs> in terms of the override and our political role, could you just review that? The Finance Committee officially supports the override. Individuals making it clear that they are representing themselves and not the finance committee can, can campaign or not for whatever side 
or no side at all? They can. Yes. Yes. Because it's an issue, it's not a person. So it's not like you then suddenly become beholden to somebody you don't like to do this by force. Yeah. But it should be made clear to everyone that your views are your own. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like even in support of the override, I would represent my views as my own because of the very discussion that we had. I didn't go out there and say, this is how the whole finance committee feels or even the people who voted against this. Anything else? All right. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Aye. 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 Aye.